Well, g'day, curd nerds. G'day, curd nerds. Well, 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 g'day, curd nerds, and welcome to an Ask the Cheese Man. This is episode 149, only one to go to reach the big 150. Ah, it's great to be here and it's great to see so many of you here in the chat and uh, watching on the live stream. This show is about asking me, uh, hopefully, and get, hopefully getting answered, uh, your home cheese making questions. Um, now, I've got some... Uh, <clears throat> With some shout outs for some new financial members for the for the show so new youtube members is um i think it's bracker pickering i think that's how you pronounce it thank you bracker for your uh, youtube membership and sebastian lombardo is now a youtube member as well and i think he's in the chat uh new patrons this week we've got james carl and we've got jason j jordan thank you both of you jason and james for your financial support um, on Patreon. If you want to become a financial member, then there's the join button below and the link in the description for Patreon. Now, some Kim news uh, as her ongoing uh, cancer treatment, and Kim's in the chat there, so uh, give a g'day to Kim. Um, so she's undergoing uh, the next stage of her cancer treatment, so she'll be doing uh, radiotherapy uh, which is basically x-rays targeted onto the affected area um, and that is every weekday for three weeks so consequently there's going to be a change to the schedule of the stream uh, apparently it's pretty taxing and um, gives you a fair bit of fatigue so what we're going to be doing is um, we're going to stop streaming until the 16th of July uh, which, which is a Sunday so that's five weeks so that's three weeks for her treatment and two weeks for her recovery now I will be making um, some cheese videos during that time and releasing them on a not so regular schedule uh, but uh, yeah the live streams will have to take a bit of a hit uh, due to the timing schedule and all that and on top of that the um, uh, city of Melbourne where we live well we're in the in the greater Melbourne we're right on the fringe of it uh, is in COVID-19 lockdown again uh, so it's I'm finding it very difficult to get my hands on the milk that I need to make a good cheese so that may be a bit of an issue um, over the next, well, it's six weeks we're in lockdown from starting last Wednesday. So there are all the things. I don't have any videos under production except for the studio, uh, which is not quite finished yet. We need to have the kitchen put in there so we can film all the other videos that we're doing. Um, but it's close to being finished. We've nearly moved all of the stock out of the house and all the bits that make our business run into the studio area which is really cool um but yeah that's all good oh 16th of oh sorry is it july now oh it's july now i just read in the chat yeah sorry the next stream will be the 16th of august not july um i made a bit of a mistake there so it's august so that's five weeks yes kim thank you very much uh for that and uh yeah kim's doing well she's in good spirits uh she's had the pre uh, consultation for the um, for the radiotherapy so she's gone through all the planning stage and all that and um, yeah it'll be it'll be all good for her alrighty so let's um, on that note let's get into the cheese questions now that you know uh, what's going on with the schedule for the channel and all that sort of stuff um, so let's say hello to some people please uh, Stefano, g'day Stefano. We've got Sebastian, g'day Sebastian. 
We got uh, Nicola and Monique. G'day, Nicola and Monique. Lovely to see both of you on the channel. We've got Robert. G'day, Robert. Uh, we've got Stranger Land and Livestock. Great name. Uh, DJ. G'day, DJ. Ruth and Patricia. G'day, both of you lovely ladies. Um, all the way. One in San Francisco and one in Nova Scotia. Uh, or oh, Halifax, which is the city there. Uh, M, M has a question, but we'll get to that in a second. Hello, M. We've got Liam, uh, Julia, Bill, uh, is that Shana? I think that's Shana. Uh, Chris, Bonnie, uh, Divulge, I think that's how you say it. Uh, Kelly, James, Jim, g'day, Jim. And thank you for your super chat, Jim. I really appreciate it. I'll even put the light on manually just for you, mate. There we go. There's a bit of a flash. There we go. Fix it. There we go. It's off now. All righty. Um, uh, I am. Uh, I am net. Oh, whatever. Um, I am netrema. I think it's how you say it. Natumia. Uh, Neteria. No, I am Neteria. There you go. Uh, Darren, Shane, oh, I said to Shana already. Uh, Tamer, John, g'day, John, lovely to see you. Uh, Jacqueline, Kim, of course, who we just had a bit of a chitty chat about. Diego, Sarah, Ed, um, Brennan, Kristen, uh, Sadie, uh, Ian, Gabrielle, Logan, Manuel, Jaden. God, we've got so many. Mary Ann, this is fantastic. Um, Addy, uh, English for you, <laughs> cool, Mayo, uh, and that'll kind of do, I think. Um, yeah, so who's Kim? Uh, for those who don't know, that's my lovely wife who's doing the moderating. Um, so, yes, uh, for all those new to the stream. Okay, um, let's get into some questions. I'm sure we've got some here. Um, Sebastian says, um, I have a question about reducing milk fat. We use raw goat and cows, sorry, cow and goats, non-pasteurized milk to make our cheese. We're making cheese that require lower milk fats. How do we reduce the fat percentage? Uh, quite easy. You just skim some of the cream off the top. A little bit harder with goat's milk. You'll have to invest in a separator, um, seeing the cream doesn't float to the top um, but yeah take off some of the cream and that reduces the fat in the milk uh, Sebastian has another question he's getting his money's worth today um, I have a question about brining large cheese wheels in one of your podcast episodes number 55 goodness me that's going back um, you talked about brining larger cheese the formula was one hour per pound per inch so uh, yeah, it all depends on the density and the thickness of the cheese on how much salt it absorbs. So the way the pound per inch, it's not pressure per se, it's just the height of the cheese. So weigh your cheese, obviously, after pressing before you put it into your um, into your brine. And make sure it's, it, it's an 18% or less otherwise specified. Um, and you just measure the height of the cheese. So if it's the taller it is, obviously the more dense and there's more volume to the cheese. Um, so if your cheese is say, uh, well, let me think, two kilos, which is four pounds, um, and it's, all right, so hang on, let me work it out. So four plant pounds, and it's three inches high, that's 12, so it's four times three is 12. So that's 12 hours in the brine. Um, so that's how you work it out. So you time multiply the the um, uh, the weight by pounds instead of kilograms um, and uh, times it by how high it is in inches. Uh, I can do a metric one of these, but not right now. And then that's how many hours it is. And there you go. So. Uh, you'll see most of the cheeses that I make are usually around the 8 to 12 hour mark of brining um, because I use 10 litres of milk. The volume's fairly constant. The yield's usually around 10 to 12%. So um, I know how dense the cheeses is and how 
long I should uh, brine them, but that's a, a rough formula for how, to, how long to brine your cheese. Okay, so on with the next question. Um, okay, let's see if I can see it. Um, DJ says, raising a cup of coffee in thanks to you both from Pennsylvania, USA, for all the great content you put out. Thank you, DJ. I appreciate it. <coughs> Emma has a question. I have a the Mad Millie Mesophilic, which is the Lactobacillus lactis and Lactobacillus cremoris cultures, and another culture that is Streptococcus thermophilus on its own. Would this be okay instead of uh, MA4001 and MO30 that you use for Kefili? Uh, let me think. Yes, it probably would, because that's fairly similar to the cultures that are in those two. Um, yeah, it would. The ratio, let me think. Uh, I would do... Mm, let me think what could be... All right, I would do... Uh, okay, let's... Uh... Uh, I would do 40% uh, of, so if you've got a Mad Millie sachet, so we're talking about a culture sachet, so I would do 80% um, uh, of the Mad Millie sachet and 20% of the Streptococcus thermophilus, uh, and that'll give you roughly the same as what MA4001 is uh, and MO30 combined. So that's the percentages or ratio, if you want to call it that. Um, to make that work. All right, thanks for your question, Em. Uh, the next question is from... Yeah, where is it? It's got to be there somewhere. Um, Ed says, can I have some cheese? Uh, fortunately not. We don't have cheese here for sale. Uh, we're just humble home cheese makers, all trying to make our own version of cheeses that are out there. Okay, John says, it's so hot here in the bay, I think that's San Francisco Bay, I can fry cheese on the sidewalk. I prefer mine with panko, not concrete dust. <laughs> Very good. Um, uh, where's the next one? The next question is from uh, Gabrielle. Says, hello, curd nerds from Sydney. Um, and Sydney's in Australia, of course, just north of us. Uh, Gavin, I have ordered the Gouda moulds from Holland with the with an inner lining. Mm, okay. Um, do you think this mould can be used for other hard cheeses? Yeah, of course. Um, it'll give you that you know unique Gouda sort of shape. Um, but I don't think you couldn't use it for any other sort of cheese, even cheddar style cheeses. You could use it for. It's just a simple press, uh, not a press, a simple mold. Um, and the one that I used from uh, Lauda in the Netherlands uh, didn't require any cheesecloth at all. There were no liners or anything like that. Um, I think it'd be suitable uh, for any of those sorts of cheeses. So go for it. Uh, thanks for your question, Gabriel. Next question is from uh, Jaden. Well, Jaden made a statement. It's the first stream he's ever made. Well. Congratulations, mate. You're here and watching. It's fantastic. Patricia says, next week I hope to get hold of some used milk to make my first halloumi. Um, any, modifi any modifications you think I should make to your cow halloumi recipe to accommodate the sheep's milk? Um, Patricia, probably just enough uh, rennet to... Just enough rennet to coagulate it. You may need though, because sheep's milk is a higher fat content than cow's milk, uh, and you get a much creamier, flavoured halloumi. Even though you know it goes fairly solid and low acidity and all that, um, you need a little bit less rennet, which is fine to coagulate your uh, your sheep's milk. Um, I found that to be the case. I found using raw sheep's milk. The curd set was hot, the most solid I've ever seen, uh, and I didn't adjust the 
the rennet down any. I omitted calcium chloride. Uh, if that's in the recipe, you won't need that. If you've got, um, uh, if you've got some raw used milk, then uh, you won't need the calcium chloride. But yeah, a little less. I would say t 10 to 15% less uh, rennet, and that should be good for you. If you find, obviously, it hasn't set, then obviously add some more and, and go for it. It should be right. Okay. Um, John says, last episode, somebody was using the stainless steel kitchen utensil caddy for pressing their cheese. Uh, there are also plastic caddies that could be used. Yeah, as long as a lot of those kitchen utensil caddies, it's a good point, John, have really large holes. Uh, they don't have very fine mesh holes. Um, so for some cheeses, they probably wouldn't be appropriate when you press them the curd's going to come out the holes um, if they've got smaller holes then fantastic there's no problems really there um, but you would definitely have to use a cheesecloth um, if you're going to press anything in those uh, kitchen utensil caddies uh, okay uh, darren says what is a good gateway blue cheese for for non blue cheese people i love it but usually eat it alone Oh, let me think. What was the mildest blue cheese that I've made? Um, if you have a look at the Cam Blue that kind of went wrong, that um, Kim, if you can put the Cam link to the Cam Blue recipe uh, that we've got on the channel, that would be fantastic. Um, Darren, that Cam Blue was, even though it was covered in blue mold, it had some some veining, very slight. It was very creamy. Um, but very light on the blue flavor. It was there, it was subtle, it was delicious, um, but that's a good one. Um, if you want a more runnier style um, blue cheese, uh, then you probably couldn't go past the Petite Blue. Uh, so Kim, if you could throw up the link to the Petite Blue as well, and I think that'll help out Darren. And his... Uh, his issue there with non-blue cheese people um, getting stuck into it. Okay, um, Artie says, or Addy says, I made a mini camembert last week and nothing happened to the cheese. What can be the problem? That's not a lot of information there, Addy, to uh, diagnose that issue. Uh, I think uh, I you would need to send me an email, I would think. So go to the About tab of the channel and there's an email address that you can send me an email uh, with any diagnosis. Don't make the question too long. I don't have a lot of time on my hands uh, to do these sorts of diagnoses outside of uh, this show, unfortunately. Okay. Um, a lot of people saying best wishes to Kim. That's really good. John Lord says, are all those fires out now and getting... Uh, the rains. Uh, yeah, the fires were out in oh uh, January? No, February. When were they? Early March. Early March all the fires were out, mate. It's now July. <laughs> it's all pretty good. Um, but yeah, that was a long time ago. Seems to, in this year anyway, she's just gone flying past with all the other stuff that's been going on. But uh, yeah, I've heard reports that a lot of the fire affected areas still haven't got the funding that they need to rebuild so a lot of people still living in temporary accommodation which is not good at all um yeah i'll leave it there um jim says um thanks at kim weber he caused me to stumble a bit since today is july 12th yeah it's yeah my dates my calendar in my brain's not working well too much going on um Kuma says, hey Gav, hope all is well. So my question is, have you ever used baking food color in a cheese? And if you did, uh, if you have, did it affect the cultures? Uh, no, I've never used artificial colors in my um, cheese making at all. I use natural colorings um, to change the colors. Uh, the main colorant, obviously, for cheeses is called a natto, which is made from a berry uh, that grows on a bush in South America. I can't remember the name of the bush, but 
it makes a natto the the ready sort of colorant um, but when you use it in very small amounts um, i'm talking about four drops per 10 liters it changes the color of the cheese slightly yellow um, and you'll find a lot of the manufactured cheddars and stuff like that they're all those cheeses are yellow because the, of the addition of anato now some high fat and good quality milks will go yellow will make the cheese cow's milk more likely will make the cheese go yellow um, because they're high in a substance called beta carotene uh, and that makes the cheese go yellow uh, that's a result of uh, the feed that the cows um, eat. Now, goat's milk and sheep's milk lack beta carotene, so they will be essentially white cheeses when you make them. It's very difficult to make a goat's cheese uh, go a different color unless you add a colorant to it. So, no to um, food colors or bake artificial food colors. Yes to coloring your cheese with natural things. And you'll see that uh, I've made say a sage derby uh, that turned the cheese a little bit green um, you can also add spinach juice just a little bit soak the curds in that that makes them a little bit uh, greener as well um, another color that i've used is kind of i made a stout cheddar uh, and that made the curds go a little bit brown because stout's black in color um, so I made that go darker but uh, yeah look some people do add other colorants but then mostly natural things like turmeric can make your cheese go a little bit yellow but that imparts a taste and it's it's not often desired in cheeses but yeah you can experiment around okay um, Martin says uh, hey cheese man thank you so much for your videos I've never made cheese before and now I'm addicted and it's your fault thanks uh, all the best from Scotland thanks very much Martin appreciate it uh, Darren says prayers to you and Kim thank you Martin uh, not Martin thank you I've got to find the name uh, thank you Darren um, Stefano says, uh, where is the reference guide for cultures from different manufacturers that are uh, subsequently the same? Oh, I do have something like that. Let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, yep, I'm just uh, pulling it up on the second monitor in a second. Uh, it's on Mary Carlin's website and I'll put up the link in a second and I can find it where is the link copy link address there we go so on Mary Carlin's website she wrote a book called Ours and Cheese Making at Home and this link is the guide to uh, all the different manufacturer cultures and um, there you'll find a list of all the different culture types pretty easy to decipher but yeah go and check that out for anybody who's interested in um, the different culture types and what you can substitute if you need to um, i also have a video on that um, kim can you put up the link to the video about starter cultures uh, and uh, that will help out stefano okay um john says could time to get uh, could time to gather up some of the ash coverings for making further ashed rub cheeses uh, not don't really understand could time to gather no i don't really understand that john sorry mate um uh mitochondria says i need help setting settling a debate in your opinion is tofu tofu just soya cheese? Uh, no, tofu is made in an entirely different process than cheese is. Uh, it doesn't use starter cultures to curdle uh, the tofu. Uh, there's no um, uh, enzyme activity of um, proteolysis and lipolysis that happens in cheese making. So there's none of that process during maturation. And in fact, there's no maturation period unless it's an aged tofu. 
but no, tofu is not soy cheese. Anyway, moving right along. Uh, Acorn says, hi, my dude. <laughs> Cowbunga, man. Um, have a great day. Love your videos. Thanks, Acorn. Um, Stefano says, I made a brine yesterday, and today I see a lot of the salt at the bottom. What is the problem? Uh, there is no problem whatsoever, Stefano. You're getting a bit too excited here, mate. Um, the uh, brine is, uh, sorry, some of the salt is sitting on the bottom because the brine is fully saturated. Um, if you've got salt sitting on the bottom, more than likely it's way above 18%. You can saturate water with salt up to 26 percent uh that's the maximum that you can chemically um so maybe your saturation is a little bit too high and the salt won't dissolve in the water uh that could be the problem um jordan g'day jordan uh from riverside california lovely to see you on here mate we've got um rainbow pinder g'day rainbow um Hacker Russo says, Gav, can you play, please make more minimalist cheeses? Minimalist cheeses. Um, not quite sure what you're after. If you're after easy, soft cheeses, then yeah, sure, I can accommodate something like that because um, the other ones do take a lot of time. Um, so I do have a few soft cheeses that I do want to try. Uh, and they're fairly quick. They don't need any maturation. It's just bingo boingo, milk, heat it up, do stuff to it, and you've got a cheese. So, yeah, I could do something like that. Thank you very much. Good suggestion. Um, okay, Divulge says, My friend is always talking about Gavin Webber, master of the clean break. Um, when did you receive this title and how? Well, it's new news to me, master of the clean break. That's rather strange but yeah i don't know i you're the first person that's ever said it so um martin says so a question mate when you are heating up the curd after cutting uh eg mozzarella what is the target temperature taken from oh is the target temperature taken from the curds all the way they can be quite different uh yeah well usually when i'm taking the temperature uh i stir it uh, we've got a super chat going on there. I'm taking the temperature when I stir the curds and whey and you get a fairly even temperature um, check. So that's from Karen. Thank you very much, Karen. Doesn't There's no message at all. Maybe down the bottom, let me have a look. Uh, no, there's nothing. But thank you so much for your kind $5 super chat, Karen. Really appreciate it. Um, okay, back to the questions again, where we're up to. Um, okay, yeah, so the temperature is, I usually take it from, well, the way is what you'll get. You can't stab the, uh, the thermometer into individual curd pieces. Very difficult to do, seeing they're moving all the time and they're very small. So it's, you're measuring the temperature of the way. Um, uh, 80 says, you're the best, I think. Thank you, 80. M says, hi, Gavin. If you put more starter culture than the recipe requires, does that change the flavor dramatically or does the culture still colonize the milk completely just more rapidly? Yeah, there's two schools of thought with this M. Um, the first is yes, it will multiply rapidly and get you to the acidification you're looking quicker. So therefore you have to be, if you're going to do that, you have to be measuring the pH of the milk to the right level of pH before you press the cheese. Now, in my recipes, I don't. I don't measure the pH for anything. Uh, it's more timed because I expect people, or hope people, don't expect, I hope people are using the right measurements of culture. If you put too much in, uh, then the acidify, it's going to acidify quicker. If you put too less, too little in, then it's not going to acidify quick enough. Uh, usually we find with um, cheeses that have too much starter culture, they tend to be, uh, if they're not stopped at the right stage, the right uh, level of pH, uh, level of uh, the acidity of the cheese is too high, you'll find that it tends to be crumbly uh, once it's mature. So that's a, that's a bit of a problem. Stephen says, finally caught the live stream. Thanks, Stephen. Lovely to see you. Herb, g'day, Herb. 
Blake, coming to the, uh, the thing, the show. Um, 80 says, is that must to let the cultures to write? Is what? Is it? A yes, we do have to let the cultures ripen in the milk, in some cheeses. Uh, that increases the overall city. Now, the reason we do that is a ripening period. At the start, we have the start of culture. Sorry, bring the milk to the right temperature, which is about 30, 32 in some cases, in most cases. We then add the starter cultures. We then stir them and let them settle and start to multiply in the milk. The reason we do that is because we're trying to get the acidity to become higher or the pH to be lower, same thing, um, because rennet needs the milk to be a little bit more acidic than normal to actually work properly. That's the reason why we let the cultures ripen or the milk ripen. Kelly says, Gavin, made your buttermilk blue. It's going soft, four weeks old. Uh, time to shave and wrap. Indeed it is. If it starts to go a little bit soft on the outside, you've got quite high proteolysis going on there. Um, maybe even best to, once it's wrapped, pop it into the kitchen fridge, bring the temperature down, let it ripen slower, a lot, lot slower at four degrees, uh, and then you won't get a really runny cheese. You'll get a nice soft, which is what you want, with a buttermilk blue. Nice soft cheese, uh, and it'll be delicious, Kelly. So try that, and that'll help. Uh, Kevin says, hey, Gav, can I use cow's milk in your goat, sheep, feta, as the original feta recipe is very old. Uh, yes, Kevin, you can. In fact, there's a new feta recipe. The one that I made, the Persian feta, um, the actual feta recipe is the same as the, the, the really old cow's milk one that I made. Uh, I've adjusted it to make it a bigger batch. So you can go and check that out. Kim, can you put the link to the most recent, the Persian feta video? So the actual making, Kevin, is the same as the old cow's milk recipe. And it works really well. It turned out delicious. It was, it was really good. So give that a go, and hopefully Kim can find the link to that and pop it in. Uh, James says, um, in a cheese cave mini fridge. Yep, yeah, that's what I've got, yeah. Uh, you have the temperature controller. Do I need a humidity controller? Also, if you vacuum pack or wax seal the cheese. Uh, James, no, you don't need to control the humidity if you're uh, waxing the cheese. So the curd nerd light is going off. That means we have a super chat. And this is from Line Dot. Five euros. Thank you, Line Dot. Uh, you've got... Um, uh, thank you for your content. You are a treasure trove of cheese knowledge, not cheese related. Which love, Mike did you use in the Persian feta taste test? A uh, bit of a technical question, but yeah, I can, um, do I have one? I don't know if I have the lav mic on me. Uh, it's a road, um, um, uh, road filmmaker. No, I can't pull it out. Um, yeah, it's made by Rode, R-O-D-E. Um, and, I used the wireless, hang on, the wireless, and I plugged it into the wireless go, not sponsored of course, this is just what I use, I'll pull it back so it's in focus. Uh, so the Rode um, uh, wireless go, and that's how I connect the lav mic to the camera, and there's a component that sits on the top, but yeah. Not cheap, but they, they're really worth it, the sound quality is really good. Got another super chat going off there. Uh, this one's from Ruth. Uh, thank you very much, Ruth, for your kind $20 US Super Chat. Uh, she says, good luck with the radiation. Get well quickly, Kim, and take care. We'll think of you. Thank you very much, Ruth. So kind. Really appreciate it. Okay, um, back to the questions now that we've got past some of the technical ones there. Uh, yeah, so James asked about the humidity. No, you don't need to control the humidity of the cheese fridge um, because like, if you only vacuum pack or wax the, the, the cheese, there's no requirement for, humid for humidity. It's locked into the cheese already, so don't have an issue. You only need to control the humidity in the cheese fridge when... Um, 
uh, when you are nat making natural rind and you're actually not using a ripening box. If you're making lots of the same cheese and you put it on the shelf in your, in your cheese fridge or what have you, then yes, you're going to have to control the overall humidity of the fridge. It's very difficult, very difficult if you've got lots of different cheeses that have different requirements. For the home cheese maker, you know, technically, I use uh, ripening boxes and that controls the humidity of the cheese for me. A ripening box is just a plastic box with a mat on the bottom to raise the cheese above the level of the bottom of the box so it doesn't sit in uh, its own moisture that's come out all the way. There you go. Oh, um, Rightio. So the next question is from Sebastian. He says, uh, follow up from my first question. Uh, how much volume cream do we need to skin off the milk to achieve 2% skim milk from a full fat milk? Um, let me think. Because the cream has most of the fat anyway, so probably half of the cream that's uh, in the milk is pretty difficult to do. But if you let the cow's milk set a little bit, you'll see the cream line. Skim off half of that. It'd be easy. All right, got another super chat there. And this one's from M. Um... Did I get that? Yeah, right, so stop flashing. Uh, M, thank you so much for your $5 super chat. Um, and it says you're from Australia, which is great. Uh, thank you for answering my questions and all the amazing YouTube videos. You are a dead set legend. Thanks, mate. I appreciate it. Thank you, M. Okay, next question is from... Uh, Matthew says, what's the best workaround for using unhomogenized milk if you can get any uh no real work around because in all of my recipes i use unhomogenized milk as well so whatever i'm doing if you do that uh matthew then you're in good stead and your cheese will work fine um unhomogenized milk most of the time it's been pasteurized so you're still going to have to add calcium chloride anyway to get a better curd set, so it's very similar to me. Okay, um, Charlie B, g'day Charlie, lovely to see you mate. Um, hello Gavin, was Tilsit a really good cheese? Uh, I think you probably, if you noticed during the Tilsit taste test video, oh, was there a Tilsit taste test or did I do it at the end of the, show, of the cheese? You know, there was a taste test. Um, it was marvellous, it was my first it was probably a different experience for me because I'd never tasted a red mould cheese or a, or a washed rind cheese before. I'd never made one. I've never tasted one. Uh, so consequently, it was my first. It was, I was a virgin as far as those sorts of cheeses went. And when I bit into the Tilsit, it was just amazing. For me, it was amazing. It was one of the the standout in my whole cheese making, it's not a career, but whole cheese making hobby, then yes, the Tilsit stood out. It still stands out in my mind today. Um, there are many others that have since, but you know, one of those very early experiences with, a, with an amazing cheese, Tilsit was really good. I can't go on about it enough. It was really good. Um, uh, Mer Meridoku says I'm on time. <laughs> Actually, you were 19 minutes late, but that's okay. Uh, Gary says, I made Manchego one month ago, and some folks say to brush off the mould and oil, while others say leave the mould and rub it with oil. What's your take on this? Uh, depends on how mouldy it is, I suppose, Gary. Um, yeah, look, uh, traditionally, I think they don't brush. They brush the mould off with a brush. It's a, not a stiff brush. It's just a soft brush. Brush it all over because mostly the outside of the rind is, is fairly dry anyway. Uh, and then oil it. And the oiling, you're trying to protect any moisture from evaporating out of the cheese. That's basically why we oil cheeses when they're asked to be oiled. So some of the hard Italian ones and some of the hard Spanish cheeses, like Manchego, are actually oiled. So there you go. Um, John says Anato is from the... Uh, Archiato berry. There you go. Thank you very much, John. I, you're there for all the things that I can't quickly research. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. And another super chat. This is from Mike. Five dollars. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, truly appreciate your 
Super chat. There's no question with it. Um, let me just scoot down the bottom of my list. Hopefully I don't lose anything. Uh, no, there's no question at all. But thank you, Mike. Appreciate it, mate. All right, scooting back up to kind of where I was, if I can find it. Uh, there we are. Um, uh, Aru and Atta, new uploads. Great name. Um, do you have distribution of your cheese? Cheeses. Uh, no, we don't sell them. We don't distribute them. Don't do anything. They're homemade cheeses just for us. And the reason I put them on video is so you can make them too. So do that. It's good fun. Uh, Kevin says, bought some Sage Derby, uh, must have some colour in it as it's almost olive green colour. Yeah, so manufactured Sage Derbies, uh, Kevin, usually do have some sort of dye in them. Not technically real Sage Derby, but yeah, they do have a dye. Not sure. Usually, um, I actually um, had some photos after I did my Sage Derby, it wasn't as green as I certainly wanted it to be. Um, uh, somebody in the UK actually made one off of my res recipe, but instead of put, well, they put sage, uh, but they blended the sage with uh, spinach and they made a, a, a spinach sludge juice, what have you, and they soaked their curds in that. And they actually was quite green on the outside after they pressed it. Very nice green marbling all through and the rind was, was fully green as well. So it could be that, uh, but yeah, I have seen some manufacturers use a green dye. Don't know what the green dye is, but yeah, spinach juice is pretty good for doing that, but you won't get an olive green color. Um, uh, Perino says, I think that's how you pronounce it. Sorry if I've mucked that up, but hi, my Caccio Cavallo uh, doesn't come shiny or pliable as in your videos. That's a bit of a problem. Uh, you're going to have to check the pH uh, of your curd. It stretches the best um, when uh, it's between a pH of 5.3 and 5. Any higher than that, you won't get a stretch. Any lower than that, it becomes crumbly and doesn't go shiny. So you've really got to monitor the pH levels of your curd. Uh, and then quickly, you know, have your, your water hot, ready to go, and then you can stretch it and stuff like that. Uh, you can actually watch, there's quite a few videos on YouTube uh, regarding commercial um, Caccio Cavallo, how they make it. And I think one of the ones I saw, and usually you don't see this, is the resting period of the curd. They actually rest the curd to let the pH come up, uh, sorry, the pH go down, so it's going down to in the fives um, or the acidity go up. Um, and yeah, it's, it's about, a, you know, I've seen up to five hours waiting period for the acidity in the cheese to um, uh, to get high enough so you can stretch it, make a shiny and all that sort of stuff. But you need good milk, good, good milk. Uh, usually it's raw milk that they use to make those sorts of cheeses. So. Uh, you you will have stretchy and pliable cheese if you use raw milk. Um, Karen says, Good morning, Kim and Gavin. I am super, super excited that I bought home a dairy goat in milk yesterday. Almost a quart twice daily. So what's that? A litre? Yeah, two litres a day. You're going to have so much milk, Karen. It's unbelievable. But well done, and uh, yeah, enjoy all the cheese making and goat milk drinking that you can do. Um, absolutely fantastic. All righty, have we got another super chat there? This is from Sebastian. Let me just uh, kill the light. Big question there. It says, uh, when it comes to vacuum packing cheese, how soon after brining and drying of the cheese can I vacuum pack a cheese for cheese like uh, Parmesan, Cheddar, Manchego. Thank you for answering all my questions. No problems at all, Sebastian. Thank you for the for the kind super chat. Right, so a couple of variations on some of those cheeses. So for like Parmesan, um, I technically do a, uh, I let the rind uh, firm up in a ripening box for a month before I vac pack it. 
Uh, and there was a comment from somebody, I can't remember who it was, last episode, last um, Ask the Cheese Man, and they said they did their Parmesan in backpack for 10 months, and then the last two, they last two months, so they're maturing it for 12 months, they let it have a natural rind, and they found that it was just the right amount of dryness and crumbliness. So for Parmesan, a little bit different. For cheddar, I just wait until it's touch dry, and then I vacuum pack the cheddar if I'm going to vac pack it. Sometimes I wax it, sometimes I cloth band it. Up to you. But vac packing, I wait until it's touch dry, and you can see that the, the surface of the cheese is slightly colored yellow. It's, it's dried out. Vacuum pack it, put it away, make sure it's turned every week in the cheese fridge. No problems at all. For Manchego, a little bit different. Uh, there's a couple of schools of thought, as we mentioned, kind of mentioned before, you can oil the cheese. Um, so you naturally make a rind. And I think in my recipe, there's an oiling phase as well. And then you oil it every month. It makes the cheese a lot drier. Remembering that typically Manchego is made from Manchego sheep's milk. Um, I made my version from cow's milk, so it kind of, it's, it's different. It's not even a Manchego, really. The flavour was there, but the colour and the texture, not so much. Um, but yeah, you can backpack Manchego as soon as it's dry, um, and you'll get a lovely flavour. You'll get the same sort of flavour, um, but it'll be a lot moister than what traditional Manchego is. So hopefully that answers all your questions for those, those three cheeses. But thanks, Sebastian, for the super chat. We've got another super chat going on here. Uh, it's Mike. Uh, uh, thank you again, Mike, for another super chat. Forgot to attach a message to the last one. Uh, thanks from a long time. Curd Nerd just made your mead recipe yesterday, and I am excited. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, appreciate it. Um, yeah, I actually had, um, I had a little tipple of the mead that I made way back last year. Um, and I tell you what, it has mellowed something shocking. It is absolutely delicious. It's the, there was, uh, I was going to say slight tannin notes. I don't know why it wasn't. It, it was just uh, one of the spices maybe was the, probably the cloves, a little bit, not overpowering, but it, it you can notice it in the mead. Um, and I only, I think I put two cloves and that's like, clove cloves not cloves of garlic but cloves um little spiky things you get in apple crumble um but yeah i there was a little it was a little bit powerful for me but i tasted it uh what about two three weeks ago had a small glass and i'll tell you what it's mellowed out it's full rounded still fairly sweet but delightful mead so kim if you can put the recipe for anybody who's interested for the mead um, up there, that will be absolutely fantastic. And thank you, Mike, for your kind $5 super chat. I appreciate it. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, Emily says, you rock. Thank you, Emily. Um, can I... There you go. You rock too, mate. Um, Meridoco says, is there a way to add spice to a raclette type of cheese? Uh, if it's on the crust... Can it flavour inside, or is that a stupid idea? Uh, no, it's not a stupid idea. Nothing's a stupid idea when it comes to cheese making, unless you do something absolutely crazy, and it just doesn't turn into the cheese that it is. But that's not stupid, that's just experience. Um, yeah, look, you can put a rub on the outside of a raclette. I, I wouldn't tend to do it to raclette. Raclette's got an amazing flavour as it is. Remember, it's a washed rind cheese. You really can't put a flavour on the outside because you're washing it all the time with a uh, a brine solution, a simple brine solution after you've done the initial brevi bacterial linens um, wash. On the inside, probably I don't know. You could maybe peppercorns or something like that. Nothing that's going to impart too much flavour um, because raclette stands on its own, as far as I'm concerned. And when you're melting the raclette, which is what they typically do with it, and melt it over potatoes and all that you know, to make raclette potatoes, uh, you don't want any obstacles in the way of your melting, basically. So, but pick a different cheese. One of my favourite cheeses to add in stuff to is farmhouse cheddar. And farmhouse cheddar, 
Uh, it's a stir curd cheddar, and you'll see lots of. I've got lots of recipes that use the farmhouse cheddar. Um, and yeah, it's, you can add anything to it, and you'll get a fairly great tasting cheese. Uh, so it's kind of my all rounder. If I want to experiment with a herb or a spice or something like that, I use the stir curd re cheddar recipe, and yeah, go for it, and it works fine. <clears throat> most of the time. Now to get the most flavour out of it, make sure that you don't just use a simple mesophilic. Use a more complex mesophilic like uh, MA4001, which also has a thermophile in there to give you a better flavour, a better cheddary sort of flavour, and the spices will kind of complement that. So that's kind of what you need to do. Okay, uh, Yawa... Yeah, oh, how do I pronounce that? Uh... Your, your, uh, I think that's how you say it. Hello, sir. I'm from Pakistan. G'day, mate. How are you? I saw all your videos. That's fantastic. Keep watching the new ones. Uh, absolutely love it. Uh, John says, spell checker, good time for gathering fire ash for ash rubbed cheeses. Uh, yes. Uh, you find that um, most of the ash that's uh, on a uh, on a cheese is actually charcoal activated charcoal uh, because the pots they used to scrub it the ash off the bottom of the copper pots which essentially is charcoal it's not ash ash is very high in alkaline it's a very high alkaline um, substance so um, you want the charcoal the black soot basically off the bottom of the copper pot um, but that's why I use, well, I use French cheese ash, which is essentially charcoal. Um, you can actually use activated charcoal. A lot of cheese making suppliers sell activated charcoal. It's exactly the same stuff um, made with a different um, plant, obviously. Uh, French ash is made with vine leaves, if I remember rightly. Anyway, uh, moving right along, we've only got uh, nine minutes to go before the end of the show. Um, Kevin says, here in Canada, uh, says, wherever you buy rennet, they never put what the IMCU is, um, only whether it's animal or non-animal or direct set, how can you tell? Uh, well, you really can't. Um, all you can do is experiment. So if you, let me think, how would we do this? Uh, a little bit technical. Send me an email, Kevin, and well, I'll try and explain it. Um, but yeah, I, I won't be able to do it on the show. It's a little bit too in depth. I'll be here for another ten minutes explaining it, uh, or my theory on how to figure it out. Anyway, um, okay. Excuse me. Yes. Um, because it's the last show for a few weeks, we'll do it tomorrow. You sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right with that. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, yeah, Kimmy's just popped ahead in, the producer, um, and said we'll go till 9.30. So we've got another half an hour, um, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Kim. She's just gone. She's gone off to the other room to do, do, the, do the... So no naughty boys or girls while she's not there. She's, she's coming back really quick. Okay. Um, Maddie B says, keep it up, died. Am I missing something there? Maybe that's dude. Uh, cool. Uh, Uncle Jerry says, Hi Gavin, greetings from the Isle of Man. Hey, I, no, I haven't been to the Isle of Man. Um, love your videos. If you could wish my beautiful beautiful fiance, Rianne, I think that's how you say it, a happy Sunday, you'd make a week. Happy Sunday, Rianne. Thanks for watching the Curd Nerd Man. That's me. Um, and uh, glad you enjoy videos and all that sort of stuff. So, Rianne. There you go, there's a bit of a wave. Um, Elsie says, um, Hi Gavin, can I save a cheese that has black mould on it? Yep, cut the mould off. Um, uh, not fairly deep, but cut the mould off and it should be right to go. Um, yeah, you won't have too many problems there, Elsie. Uh, just make sure it's well wrapped and kept in the fridge and it doesn't go any further mouldier. If you have cut it off and the mould grows back again, you haven't eaten it quick enough. That's what cheese is for. <laughs> Eat it. <laughs> uh, but you can use a, a little bit of vinegar on a cloth and wipe it off. The mould comes off and dies. Um, Stefano says, thanks, mate. No problems at all. Uh, Shellshock says, the cheese man, I like you. Thumbs up. Thank you, Shellshock. Appreciate it. Um, 
And Nicola says, Kevin, you could measure flocculation time and determine it from uh, the IMCU from it. Yeah, you could actually. Flocculation time is uh, the best way. It, yeah, it actually, that is a great idea, Nicola. I should have thought of that. Flocculation, I don't want to explain it too much. It's the time uh, that uh, you can put a little object, a little, it's usually a little plastic tub, a little, very small, on top of your milk. It's got to be sanitized, of course. So after you put your rennet in, it's the time that that little plastic thing stops moving on top of the milk. So normally you can spin it because the milk's fluid. As soon as it goes solid, then you use a flocculation table, which I've actually got on my website somewhere. Uh, I'm not going to look for it. You'll have to go over to littlegreencheese.com and have a look, look up the word flocculation, uh, Kevin. And there's a table determining the timings the multiplication of the, the flocculation time, how long it took to flocculate or coagulate, the same sort of stuff, or just to go stiff. And then you multiply that depending on the type of cheese that you're making. That way you don't have to worry about what IMCU your rennet is. It just determines when you need to cut the curd. So yeah, floc flocculation time. Well done, Nicola. Appreciate your help, mate. I really do. Uh, Karen says, my super chat was to ask a question. Oh, Okay, so here's your question. At times when I open an aged cheese, my mouth will tingle. What causes this? An aged cheese, my mouth will tingle. Hmm, that's a good one. Um, you don't say what type of cheese. If it's a penicillin style cheese, so a mold ripened cheese, usually blue, I actually get that mouth tingle if the blue is very, very strong. So what's what's an example? The Shropshire Blue that I made, or the Shropshire, whatever they want to call it, Shropshire, Shropshire, that's how you say it, Blue that I made was very strong. It actually gave me a bitey tongue, a very, not sore, but it, 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 it had a different sensation on my tongue. Uh, and aged cheeses is usually the... Um, uh, calcium lactate crystals or the tyrosine crystals, yep, yeah, um, that cause that tingling on your tongue as well. Uh, they're that they gives you the crunch in the cheese with aged cheeses. So yeah, that's Karen. That's what it is. Um, uh, where are we? Uh, Gustav says, "Hello, sir. What's your favourite cheese?" As I say on all the the. All the streams, all the cheeses are my favourite cheese. Um, Swaggery says, uh, "How does how does for goat feta taste different from cow feta?" Um, okay, yep. Yeah. So goat's milk has a higher concentration of lipase, which is not not all of it gets killed off during pasteurisation. So lipase causes um, the cheese to have a, pardon me, a more piquant flavour or a spicy flavour. Not spicy as in her, uh, spices like chilli, it's not like that. It's a different flavour. Goat's milk will, uh, goat's cheese will taste totally different than cow's cheese. Um, it will be more crumblier. Uh, cow's feta is normally not as crumbly um, as, uh, as goat's feta or sorry traditional greek feta made by using that is traditionally made and registered with what's it called dop or pdo um uh, so protection designation uh in europe has to be at least 70 percent uh sheep's milk and 30 percent goat's milk so that's traditional feta and that that is in a world of its own tastes totally different and is amazing. So the pretend fetters that we make um, using just goat's milk or just cow's milk don't taste anything like the real thing. Um, but they're a pretty good facsimile. Um, that's why I kind of changed the name of my Persian fetter, uh, spelt um, F-E-T-T-A-Q. So it's pronounced fetter, but the Q silent, uh, of course. Tastes different, tastes a lot different um, due to the lipase in goat's milk. Anyway, that's about all I can say. You've got to make it yourself to figure it out. 
Uh, Dwayne says, hello, Gavin and Kim. G'day, Dwayne. Lovely to see you, mate. Israel, Israel, yep, uh, says, hello, I'm from Brazil. G'day, mate. How are you? Jordan says, do we follow the directions on the bottle and cultures, rennet, anato, calcium chloride and cultures, or do we follow the recipe directions for measurements? Sometimes they differ. Uh, Jordan, I would stick with the manufacturer's recommended doses if they differ from, uh, quite dramatically, from the uh, recipe. You know, recipes are a guide. Uh, if the manufacturer puts specific doses on their bottles um, or anato or what have you, they sometimes vary the strength and all that sort of stuff. Then use what they put on the bottle. I don't know what their standard. Usually it would be per litre of milk. So you'll have to figure it out from there, Jordan. But yeah, um, sometimes they do differ. I haven't come across too many that do. But remember that I use the same rennet and uh, calcium chloride that I've always used. I always use um, Chimax Plus as the, the rennet, uh, which has an IMC of 200. And that's what all my recipes are based on. You know, you can use up to 280 IMCU if you want to. Um, I've done that and the, they worked out fine. But yeah, um, no problems at all. Hope that helps. Um, Tofty says, I want to make cheese using lipase. Which cheese do you recommend? Um, we only add lipase to uh, milk if it lacks it, if it's not raw milk. So if it's been pasteurized. So... Um, you know, you can add lipase to quick mozzarella. I add lipase to cow's milk feta to give it that kind of goaty flavor. Um, I also add lipase to some of the hard Italian cheeses because uh, a fair bit of the lipase is uh, dissipated from pasteurization, been destroyed. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and I only use, uh, there are three types of lipase. So there's calf, kid and piglet. Uh, I tend to use calf lipase if I use it. But yeah, I hope that answers your question, Tofty. Okay. Next question is from Harry. Harry says, noob question. <laughs> uh, nothing like a noob question. Uh, is it worth it instead of buying it time, money wise? No disrespect, but is the quality superior or is it a love thing? Um,. Yeah, great question. And I actually did a whole Ask the Cheese Man on this, just that single question. Kim, if, can you um, find the video where it talks about is it worth uh, making your own cheese? Um, you may have to try and find a little bit, but it's definitely there. Um, it's a little bit of both. The quality is superior than some of the commercial cheeses that I've seen uh, because, you know, you've made an individual batch yourself. Uh, it is a love thing. I love to make cheese. A lot of people in the chat love to make cheese. Um, but I think it is worth it. You know, if you're making a decent sized batch and, you know, uh, your family loves the cheese, then yeah, why not make it? It's like home brewing. You know, is home brewing cheaper? Yeah, I think it is eventually over time. Is home cheese making worth it? Yeah, if you're making a superior quality product, uh, because cheese is not cheap these days. Since COVID-19 hit, cheese is expensive. Um, not that it wasn't before. Some of the more quality cheeses, they're really expensive per kilogram. So, yeah, you can make it cheaper per kilogram yourself uh, than buying it, as long as it's a decent quality and not, you know, a bit of a mess. But answer your question, Harry. Hopefully Kim's got the link there for you um, for that video about um, is it worth making your own cheese? I kind of go off on a bit of a rant in that video, but check it out and I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, um, Nicola's got an opinion on that question actually. He says, uh, it's both in my opinion. I still buy a lot of cheese, but I still make my own. Yeah, I, we buy a fair bit of cheese still too, because uh, not only you, you want to see different variations of you know artisan or commercial based cheeses, and try and make it yourself. So, you know, how can you make a different sort of cheese or different style of cheese if you don't try something different? So, yeah, I agree with Nicola, actually. Um, Strangerland says, um, how old is too old for Renner? Mine's approaching a year old. Keep it or dispose of it and buy new. Um, look, Renner can, I've 
use running up to two years old, but that's uh, uh, fermented chymosin uh, rennet, not animal rennet. Animal rennet will go off a lot quicker. Uh, so if it's animal rennet and it's a year old, I would buy some more, definitely. Uh, it's got to be kept in the fridge at four degrees Celsius. Rennet is, uh, it, its activity uh, weakens the warmer it gets. Um, so, uh, yep, keep it in the fridge. Um, yeah, look, it's up to you. If you don't think it's working, get some, get some more. Uh, uh, Meridoco says, I realised you have heterochromia. Amazing. Yes, one eye is um, uh, brown, green. I think it's green. I don't know which one. Um, and the other one is blue. Uh, yes, I do have heterochromia. Uh, it's called he heterochromia iridium is the full term for it. Uh, it's just, I'm just special. And I'm left-handed, so go figure that one out. Anyway, um, uh, Matthew says, thanks for all your help. Thanks, Matthew. Um, Mar Martin uh, says, what's the best cheese you've made? Ooh, best cheese I've ever made. I don't know, there's been so many. Um, I think it's been over, a, uh, at last count, it was 144 different cheeses I've made, but I think I've made more since then. Uh, that count was a while back. Probably made about 150 by now, different cheeses. Um, oh, look, there's some standouts. You only have to watch the taste test videos. You'll see my reaction. Um, I don't hold back. If it's yucky, I'll tell you. Uh, if it's really nice and amazing, I'll just wax lyrical about it. Um, but, yeah, there's been some standouts, I suppose. Like I said before, uh, earlier in the stream, Tilsit was one of the most memorable ones for sure um uh visually the farmhouse cheddar blue uh really rocked my socks the blue veining throughout it was just spectacular and the flavor was great too for the creamiest blue cheese that I've ever made uh buttermilk blue you can't go past that i thought it was going to be a total disaster uh and i just played along really to uh to show you whether you know to keep going if there's a failure and once I got to the final product, the blue cheese was just spectacular. It was so creamy and delicious. Uh, so buttermilk blue was a standout. That was amazing. Um, my very first Stilton, uh, I still remember that, the blue veining through that and the flavour was amazing. I haven't made a Stilton for ages. I really do need to make another one. They are really delightful, creamy cheeses. Um, what else? Oh, my first cheddar. The, when I tasted the ch that cheddar at a year old, uh, the cloth banded cheddar that I made, oh, it just blew my mind. That was amazing. And another one that sticks out, the Pecorino Romano that I made with sheep's milk, raw sheep's milk, that I tasted at the uh, two and a half year mark. I kept it for two and a half years. That blew my mind as well. The flavour was so intense and just... Oh, blows my mind. There's some of the best cheeses that I've made. I could probably make a video about that. Wouldn't that be cool? Be easy to make too. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, some of the, I think there's some of the best ones that I've made. Uh, other, the, even the Persian feta that I made the other day, I t tell you what, that was just really, really good. That was delightful. And the Gouda, I tell you what, that was, um, my son Ben doesn't normally eat much of the cheese that I do. He, he tastes the sampler after I've done the taste test, just like Kim does. But he loved that Gouda so much. Um, he's demolished like, I don't know, a third of the cheese, the wheel of cheese. In in two or three days, he just loved it. So, you know, it's what's, what's good for some people are, are fantastic for others. So, yeah, cool. Thanks for your question, Martin. I appreciate it. Uh, John says, there's a four by six and a half, is that inches, uh, tall stainless steel caddy, very small side holes and bottom drain sides, uh, and there's a link to it uh, there if anybody's interested. Um, uh, Gabrielle says, hi Gavin, question again, I've purchased a tub of cheese coating from England. Uh, have you used it instead of waxing? Uh, no, I think you're talking about the PVA uh, coating that you can put on cheeses. Uh, normally it's used in conjunction with waxing. 
Uh, it has an anti-bacterial uh, property. It's a, a PVA plastic coating usually that you just paint onto the cheese. Prevents it getting mouldy. And then you'll see a lot of the cheese, uh, cheese manufacturers will wax over the top of that. Uh, case in point, if you ever buy a, a baby bell, one of the, you know, little tiny red cheeses with wax all over it, when you pull off the little thing, you'll see there's a white coating underneath the red wax. And that white coating is the PVA coating that um, you put over the cheese. So yeah, so they put, tend to put that PVA coating first, let that dry totally, and then wax the cheese. All right, it won't melt off. There you go. Um, Mike says, oops, forgot to send a chat. Just wanted to say thank you from a long time curd nerd. Actually just made your mead recipe as well. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate it, mate. Um, Jordan says, how long should we age Montazio? Um, now my Montazio, I neglected it, so I don't think I ever made a taste test video of it. Uh, I did try it early on, but I can't remember how long it's supposed to age. It's in the video description. So Kim, if you can put the video up for uh, Jordan, I'm pretty sure I'll say it at the end. I think it's a few months, but I want to do a honey rubbed Montazio. I think Ruth's actually made it, who's in the chat. Um, and uh, I think it turned out really nice for us. So I do want to try that once I can get a, a, a milk supply again. Um, so yeah, that'll be good. Um, uh, Tofty says, have I ever made Tellagio? Uh, it's a fantastic cheese and fairly easy to make. It's worth trying. I actually do have a Tellagio mold. I have never made Tellagio, uh, but it is on my list of cheeses to make. It will be quite interesting because I, I actually need the reed matting that goes underneath, but I don't have any. So, um, and I can't get my hands on it, but I'll have a look around and see what's going on. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the suggestion, Tofty. Uh, Newcomb MC Gaming says, Hey Gav, wishing you and your wife warm wishes from the States. Thanks, Newcomb. Appreciate it. Uh, next question is from Jordan. Jordan says, Do you think I could use your Sage Derby recipe but use cilantro instead? Uh, do you think it would come out and be good? I actually have your Sage Derby air drying right now. Oh, okay, well done, Jordan. Cilantro, so in in my language, in Australian, that would be coriander. Coriander is a very powerful flavor. Um, and if you like coriander or cilantro, then yeah, it probably would be okay. I could not see why you couldn't substitute uh, sage for uh, sorry, coriander or cilantro for uh, sage. So I think, um, yeah, I don't think you'll have any problems. It actually might even make it a bit greener, uh, Jordan, as well, because it's a more uh, moister herb, if that makes sense. So yeah, go for it. I think that'd be good. Uh, when you do, send me a picture. That would be fabulous. And I'll put it in the gallery. In fact, that's what I forgot to do. I've actually got a gallery picture. Oh, I've got one. Um, let me just pull it up on screen number two and make it a bit bigger. Uh, this is sent in by Cameron Teague. Uh, that's as big as it gets. Here we go, go to the desktop. So you can see the, this is a blue cheese. This is a Stilton that Cameron has made. Um, it looks very much like the rind of my buttermilk blue. Um, but I think it looks fabulous. And he, he said, is this normal? I said, yes, it is indeed. Totally normal. Totally normal indeed. Um, I do have another picture that he sent in. Oh, here it is. There. So there's the top of it. I'll just uh, expand this out. So you can see here, I don't know if you can see my pointer on the screen, a little white dot there. Um, he's pierced it there. So I think you'll get fairly good marbling. So just so you don't get an overpowering um uh taste uh there cameron what i do recommend to do is is scrape off the blue on the outside you'll see most commercial operations uh, for good reason scrape the blue off the outside it's too overpowering what they're trying to do is get that blue flavor onto the inside um, either via the piercing or uh, via proteolysis from the outside to make 
the blue flavour in there. So scrape off that very thick uh, rind and you'll have a fantastic cheese. Uh, you'll even see in the buttermilk blue, oh no, not the buttermilk blue, yeah, the buttermilk blue, I, I scraped off the rind. Also, the um, even the petite blues that I made, my own cheese recipe, blue cheese recipe, you'll see that I scraped the um, the blue mould off. It's Unless you like it really, really strong and tingly on your tongue, then scrape it off. I, I tend to do that. Okay. Um, Brian says, is 63 Fahrenheit and to 68 Fahrenheit and 50% humidity okay for a cheese cave? Uh, is that, that's the general conditions in my basement. I have a fridge with a temperature controller, but I use that mostly on beer, meat and, and wine brewing. Uh, 63 is too high. It needs to be between 50 and 55 or 10 Celsius to 13 Celsius. Uh, and uh, humidity, not so much of a worry if you wax and vacuum pack and use ripening boxes. Don't Humidity doesn't really matter. Um, but no, that's too high. You'll get uh, excessive uh, enzyme activity in your cheese and they will ripen too quickly and especially if you're making things like mold or blue rind or even washed rind cheeses they will ripen rapidly and go mushy and runny um, but no the temperature is too high and even if you're using um, uh, if you're waxing your cheeses you'll find uh, they will tend to weep uh, oil at that higher temperature so no, it's not 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 low enough, unfortunately. Um, Newcomb says, Hi, Kim. Didn't know you were in the chat as well. Warm wishes to my family from yours. Thanks, mate. Uh, Mike from Austria says, Good day, mate. <laughs> Just found your channel yesterday. Well, good day, Mike. Lovely to see you on the chat. Uh, we've got 15 minutes to go. Um, uh, let me get another super chat and I'll just get that. We're going to figure it out. It hasn't popped up yet. I don't know where it is. Where's it gone? Right down the bottom. It's from Paul. G'day, Paul. Lovely to see you, mate. And there's your little cheesy wedge there. There it is. Uh, thank you very much for your kind dollar, $2 super chat. I don't know if you can put a comment in there. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, you don't seem to have anything there. But uh, thanks for your super chat. Anyway, let's get back up to where the other questions are. Um... Uh, okay, Mike from Austria says, greetings from Tokyo. So Mike's from Austria, but he lives in Tokyo. Very nice. Thanks, Mike. Um, Peter says, um, Gavin, I really love you. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Peter. Um, your charm and wit and expertise has made... What? Uh, yo, Rinto, the depths of my milky heart. Made... Oh, I'm not sure what that says, but... Uh, you really go out of your way, pun intended, for delivering such masterpieces to us. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate it, mate. Um, John says, that clove flavour, which is the dental numbing oil, yes it is, uh, will mellow out and highly antibacterial, so also mellow with its current peat no can become excellent with more time. Yeah, I've, I've definitely found that, John. The the clove flavour, it, uh, it definitely needed to be there to make it the you know the spiced kind of mead that I made. Um, and I didn't use too many because the instructions said don't use too many because it's overpowering. Um, but yeah, it is mellowing very nicely indeed. That mead is delightful to drink now. Not that it wasn't delightful to drink after the five months of, um, uh, of maturation that I left it for. Uh, but yeah, it was good. Uh, definitely not, Dan says. It's not raclette if you add spice. Well, I do tend to agree it is not raclette. It'll be something else. Um, uh, Maria, I think that's how you pronounce it. Maria says, uh, what inspired you to start making cheese and posting it on YouTube? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, what... <laughs> I just think, well, we're trying to live our lives more sustainably. We're growing our own food, uh, so like our own vegetables, or trying to anyway. Um, planting fruit trees around our, you know, suburban block. We've only got, um, it's like 800 square metres 
uh, but we're using it well. So we've got fruit trees in pots and in the ground and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, and we had chickens and stuff like that. So we were preserving a lot of stuff and I wanted to know, well, you know, could you make cheese? I was making beer at the time, so I could do all that as well. Um, so how to make cheese. So I went on a cheese making course and the rest is history, really. Um, I learned how to do that. And I thought, well, I was doing videos of other things around our yard on the channel originally and it wasn't called gavin weber it was called the greening of gavin or something which was the name of my old blog which was my sustainable living blog so i i noticed that the videos that were cheese videos the cheese ones that i did really basic really crude cheese videos without any uh, you know the voiceover was me when i was making the cheese there was no recipe titles. There was no recipe on the front. It was just basic compared to the ones today. Um, they were getting a lot higher views than what the other sustainable was. So if I put one up about chickens, I'd get like 100 views. If I put one up about cheese, I'd get thousands upon thousands of views. So it made my little brain think. I said, uh, if I want to share something let's share something people are willing to watch so that's what i did i deleted all of the other videos that i had on my channel and just left the cheese ones behind put all those other videos onto my vlog channel which you can find uh the, the, if you go to the main channel page you'll see there's a little link to gavin weber vlog or vlogs or whatever it's called uh, and you'll see all the other videos there including the uh, couple of TV appearances that I was on as well. I was on TV a few times for the Greeny and Gavin blog because people couldn't believe that I could grow so much food in my backyard and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, it was all very cool. Um, yeah, so I just kept on going making cheese videos, you know, once a month at the start, once every six months occasionally. Then I got serious and uh, decided to start posting every week and doing a live stream every week. So the rest is history. And here we are. We've got... Um, I don't know, 232,000 subscribers who I all treasure. Um, they are lovely people and I have a great cheese making community. Anyway, fantastic question. Thank you so much for asking that. Okay, the next one is from uh, Peter and we've only got eight minutes left to go. It says, anyway, what are the substitutes for calcium chloride and what are the precautions when it comes to using unpasteurized milk? Um, there are no substitutes for calcium chloride. Um, you use it when you have heat treated milk, pasteurized milk, so it's a better curd because you're adding back more soluble calcium. So it can create the, um, what's it called? The casein, uh, B, uh, casein K structure that makes the curd solid. Um, precautions when using raw milk. Make sure the source is okay. Use it within three days. Uh, filter it uh, just through cheesecloth so there's no bits in it. Um, what else? If worse comes to worse and you don't trust the source of the raw milk, then pasteurize it yourself at home using the low temperature, low hold method. Hopefully that answers your question, Peter. Tim says, well, what have you done? Sorry, have you done a blue squeaky cheese curd? Wondering if that wondering what to use to get the blue flavor no i haven't and it's very hard uh, cheese curds are fresh they're they're eaten the same day that you make them usually uh, for the home cheese maker and blue cheese mold or penicillin roque 40 takes at least 10 days to grow so you won't get any blue cheese squeaky curd uh, if you do they've made a cheese cut it up and pretended or something like that um, Rex says, hey Daddy Gav, hope you got my emailed videos from Manila. Uh, can't say I have, Rex, uh, unless you sent them via email this morning. I haven't looked at my emails. National Crafter says, uh, so glad to see you're doing well, Gavin. Have you ever used a cheese that you've made to make another cheese? Uh, technically, yes. I made some tangy yogurt so that I could make provolone, if that makes sense. I used the tangy yogurt as a starter culture for the provolone, and that seemed to work okay. I got a nice looking provolone out of it and tasted quite good. 
So that's the only case where I've done that. Um, Rue says, so glad you feel well enough to go longer, Kim. I can't stay this time. Thanks for another great chat. Um, stay well and be safe, everybody. See you in August. Thank you so much, Ruth. I appreciate it. Uh, Patricia says, so what's Kim's favourite cheese and Ben's favourite cheese? Uh, well, I might have mentioned it before. Ben's favourite cheese is the Gouda that I made the other day. Can't get enough of it. There's still a little bit left, but I'm trying to hold that off so I can have some on a cheese platter with Kim. Um, Kim's favourite cheese? Uh, I don't know. You'll have to let her mention that. I don't know if she's put that in there somewhere. Yep, oh, she has, down the bottom. She says she is loving the Persian feta at the moment. It's so good. Yeah, and Ben's is the gouda, most definitely. Um, uh, Line Dot says, have you ever made a retrospective video on multiple cheeses, like an overview or favourite cheeses in 20-something, with a couple of words for each, to help somebody choose what to watch? Uh, and Nicola has rightly said there that, uh, yes, there are six cheeses you must make in 2020, and Kimmy, can you put the link to that if you can find it? It should be there somewhere. But yeah, Nicola, fantastic. Thank you very much for helping out, mate. Um, Mike says, hello, Gavin and Kim. What is the best way to preserve cheese after ripening? I vacuum seal my cheese and it won't last in the regular uh, fridge. Uh, yeah, look, I just re-vacuum pack it. After I've taste tested it, uh, cut it up, the best way to keep it as it is right there is to re-vacuum pack it if you can um, and then put it in the normal kitchen fridge to slow the ripening right down and you'll have a cheese with the similar flavour uh, and the texture and it'll be all good. So I just store it in backpack. There's heaps in my kitchen fridge, as Kim will attest to. Um, let me think. Um, uh, James says, have you finally mastered cottage cheese yet? No, I haven't, unfortunately, James. Uh, and because I can't get my hands on raw milk, I won't be making cottage cheese anytime soon. Um, cream cheese is in... A, oh, who's this from? Coin Man. Uh, cream cheese is in America. Seem to be very, very by brand. What do you think that is? Well, most of the cream cheeses that I've seen manufactured like say Philadelphia cream cheese actually has a lot of oil in it that they turn into like a cheese kind of thing. There's not a lot of cheese in cream cheeses, especially those block sort of ones. Okay, um, we're getting to the end of the show. Kim should be giving me the wind up very soon. Um, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, she has. I knew she was going to. Um, Thank you so much for watching today for this extended hour and a half live stream chat. Uh, appreciate all your questions and hopefully you got some value out of that for any cheese makers that uh, had some of those burning questions. Um, I couldn't get to all the questions. I nearly got to the end, but uh, yeah, sorry about that. Now, if you want to support the show financially, don't forget you can hit the join button below um, and you get early access to videos as I release them, including podcast episodes uh, on my podcast channel, which I have here. We are releasing one as often as I possibly can. I'll put the link to the podcast channel in as well. So there's the podcast channel. Don't forget to go and check that out. Um, also, uh, if you want to buy any merch like this cool T-shirt, which I don't know if I've shown before, there we go. It's uh, actually a picture of me that Kim drew, and it's me eating cheese and wine, but I'm a mouse. So, yes, very cool. That actually features in the book, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, uh, which is available at all good ebook stores and on our website, uh, which we can send to you. Okay, thanks so much. We will see you again on the 16th of August. August. Uh, due to Kim's treatment. We're having five weeks off from the live streams. We'll see you back then. Um, we'll be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to tackle any of your home cheese-making questions. But there will be other videos splattered out through that time. Hopefully, I'm going to get one up a week. We'll see how we go. If it's a bit too taxing, I'll make an announcement on the community tab and let you know when we're going to release some more. But thanks so much for all of your support. Uh, it really does help. All right, until next time, see you later, curd nerds.